bags of crap available for sale. Uh, again, all of the money goes directly to charity. Uh, if you're looking for conference t-shirts, uh, the bags of crap contain at least one shirt in them. So uh, buy a bag of crap, give some money to charity, uh, feel good about yourself and have a t-shirt. Um, if you have anything that you've really loved about ShmooCon, or things that you thought sucked, or things that we, you think that we could do better, uh, please let us know. Send us an email to feedback at shmoocon.org. Um, we take all of that feedback to heart, and we do our best to try and improve year after year. So if there's anything that you think that we did amazing and you'd like to see it again, or again, if there's something that you thought that we sucked at and we could improve on, let us know. Uh, let's see. If you stayed at this hotel overnight and you did not use our room code, please let us know. Send an email to info at shmoocon.org with your reservation ID so we can get credit for that. One of the reasons we're able to keep this conference uh, relatively cost, uh, uh, the cost relatively low is through the use of the, uh, the hotel giving us credit for people that stay at the hotel. If you are local and you parked in a hotel, so if you drove here, um, and you, you parked here, uh, we have a parking pass that will give you a discount. Of course, if you stay in the hotel overnight, your parking for that is cheaper than, than the discount that we can give you. So if you, like I said, if you're local and you drove and you stayed here, you're, you're parking here, uh, come by registration and get a parking pass, and it'll give you like a 15% discount on your parking. All right. Oh, uh, DVD is for sale. Uh, for all of the talks that you have seen this weekend are available, uh, Ted, has a booth just outside of the, the hallway for the, the talks. Um, he does this out of the courtesy of his heart. He drives, well, flew this year for the first time to ShmooCon across country to record these. He also enables us to do the internet streaming for people that couldn't hit, click uh, hit F5 fast enough on their laptops. Um, and all of that happens because of Ted. Uh, all, of that, uh, all of the camera equipment and whatnot is all because of him. So. If you have the ability, please buy some DVDs uh, and take them back and share them with your friends and family and coworkers. All right, so I have a few things to give away and then I'll go ahead and let Carson get started. Is anybody still wearing the clothing they wore last night? <laughs> All right, I have a present for you. Don't eat it. <laughs> it is a pipod. Do not eat it. I know that there was a, a bunch of those being given out upstairs in the bar last night. What? Okay, well, don't eat it. But do they taste different? <laughs> don't eat it. ShmooCon does not recommend eating Tide Pods. Neither do I. All right, so I have a, uh, a book from Raytheon. Well, Raytheon is giving away this book, The 24 Deadly Sins of Software Security. Is there anybody that's a student in the audience? I'll give you this book. So come up here and you can have this. All right. Um, only one student in the audience. Good for you.
triage and dispatch. Not your grandfather's team. Um, I also promise you I'll do my best to make sure that these slides here are uh, BS marketing free. Um, that actually was a sticker on the side of a coffee machine in Hyderabad. Um, the guy who spoke English very well next to me laughed his ass off when he saw it. I'm like, what the heck is that? So uh, there was a simpler time, um, a time when you assumed um, that uh, relational databases are the way you stored vast quantities of uh, information. Um, 15,000 uh, RPM disks were fast. Um, a box with more than four, perhaps eight CPUs or CPU cores, because we didn't really have a distinction at the time, was a lot. Um, more than a, a ten, you know, 10 or 20 million events a day was a lot of data. And one monolithic product was sufficient uh, to support your security operations center. Um, are any of these assumptions still true? Anyone? Bueller, I'm getting thumbs down. Who says yes? No one, good. Um, oh, and the only people in the SOC, um, who, the only people who consumed a lot of that security relevant data were in the SOC. Now, none of these are true. Um, and by the way, my first SIEM uh, install was on that thing on the right. Uh, does anybody happen to know what piece of hardware that is? Sun Enterprise what? 450, who got it? Come up and get a book. I still have a few of them. No, I'm not throwing them. They, it would explode, promise you. Thank you. You can't get those on Amazon, by the way. You can only download them. Um, so none of these things are true anymore, uh, um, but it gets more interesting than that. Um, six years ago, um, I had a, a highly religious experience as far as religious experiences go on the job. Um, a guy I worked with uh, who's really smart, uh, brilliant engineer, um, had this new system called Elasticsearch. And uh, he deployed the Elasticsearch on a number of systems that were full of solid state disks before anybody really realized how awesome solid state storage was. And we were sitting there one day after the system came online and we were searching for data and we were, we were running a, a ridiculous queries over billions of events and we were getting results back in seconds. Now, to you today, this might seem like obvious. Of course I would get results back from a query over billions of events in seconds. But back then it was like, holy shit, dude. This is ridiculous. I don't want to use my seam anymore. And, we, and people would ask us, well, do, do you still need a seam? And my answer was, it depends. Why does it depend? Why would you still want some of that old technology in the face of vastly superior search technology? Let me explain. Um, who are we going to engineer this capability for? If you're, if you're putting together an analytic capability for a SOC, um, who are your users? Well, the SOC, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I'm going to actually use uh, Star Trek to talk about computers here. So if there was, if I ever had any hope of not being called a geek, it, it's over for me today. Um, so here we are. Here's the, the bridge crew. Um, and um, they all have different roles and different backgrounds. Um, you know, tier one, tier two, your responders, your hunters, your data scientists, if you're lucky, uh, your analytics authors, your engineers, the leads, and finally upper management. And uh, each, by the way, for those of you who can't see very well, that is Wesley um, as tier one. Um, each of them have different questions. Um, and not to oversimplify things too much, tier one has the question, where do I start? Tier two, what really happened? Uh, the hunters, where is the adversary? Uh, clicky, clicky, come on, there we go. Um, the responders, what do we do next? What question is better finding the adversary? What detections can I create? How do I keep the system running well? How's my SOC doing? And how's my security program doing overall? Each of these folks have fundamentally, although certainly some overlap, oftentimes different questions of the data that we're collecting. Who are we building the, the SIM for? All of them. So we need to think about 
how do we cater each of their needs? Let me be um, specific about some of them in just a second. It's not just about one product anymore either, or one data store. Um, chances are, in your enterprise today, um, the data lakes, the data stores, the databases, the data something um, are proliferating. You are probably, if you are the SOC, you are no longer the only organization with a pile of security relevant data. Um, this accessory might not be supported. Uh, you can't put an agent on everything, necessarily. Um, and you'll probably never reach 100% coverage. I mean, what is 100% anyways? I have a whole rant on that separately. Um, the result, of course, is that you need to make um, very careful choices about your resource investments. Um, and you need to pay just as much attention to integration as, as aggregation. I'll show you that in the next slide. And I would urge you not to chase your monitoring percentages uh, to a fault. Um, there's a lot of folks I've run into that says, oh, we have to have 100% coverage. What, you know, 100% today is different than 100% yesterday or tomorrow. Are you ever going to reach 100%? No. I would urge you instead to, to focus on other dimensions of coverage, and I'll talk about that at the end of the brief. It's also about, it's not just about one product anymore. When we think about catering to tier one, we think about that, that analyst triage um, scenario there in the middle, but there's other pieces. Ticketing and workflow, integrating business context, drilling down to artifacts including PCAP, um, the analytic engine that runs in near real time, whatever platform your data scientists are leveraging, how we're doing query and visualization of that data ad hoc or otherwise, um, EDR or something like it, particularly um, bringing in um, super high fidelity host telemetry and threat intelligence. Now, um, not all of these have to be necessarily a different product or a different system. Sometimes they are. Um, and if they are, every single one of those arrows, which is between almost every box in this picture, is an opportunity for either integration or merging of, of functionality. And one of the things that concerns me sometimes, let's say, for instance, I bring in a really hot, super awesome EDR product into my enterprise. And uh, that square there on that, that chart is going to be covered really well. And they'll also probably talk to me, yeah, you can annotate alerts, and you can escalate them, and, and you can start in moving into some of the other, the other uh, pieces of the puzzle, but how well are you really doing that? So the, uh, the job for engineers in a SOC today is a big integration story, particularly for larger SOCs. Now, when we think about tier one drilling back to them for a second, um, let's think about some of the major things they have to do. When I, um, I interviewed some folks in, in, a, in a tier one shop nah, a couple years ago, and um, we had had in mind for them this big, ornate, super awesome, super high speed, um, super resilient architecture for ingesting and correlating data and all that fun stuff. And they weren't interested in any of that. What they were interested in was how are they going to triage events in the most efficient manner possible. For example, um, how do they claim them? How do they annotate them? How do they suppress them? Um, how are they doing analytics? How are they viewing the outputs of those analytics? Can they inspect the syntax of it? Um, how do they communicate with one another? Um, and how are they documenting um, their, their case information? Um, you know, like I said, uh, when I used Kibana for the first time a long time ago, it was a mind-blowing experience for me. But do we ask a, a, a tool like Kibana to do all these things? No. Um, at least not the free version. All due respect to the great folks who wrote that tool. So we have to think about these requirements as well as the detailed requirements of the other folks in our SOC uh, when we put together these kinds of capabilities. Moving on. Uh, we also think about this spectrum um, of very sad analyst to very happy analyst. Let me, uh, let me describe what I mean here. I mean, the worst case scenario, a given piece of data that might um, benefit us either doesn't exist or we haven't found it yet. Um, a little bit better than that, we have to ask other people for it. We have to manually swivel chair to it. And we have access to it directly, but it's not integrated. Uh, number four, we've built those integrations so that an analyst can right click on an alert or something similar and, and pivot to the other tool without having to jam in their query manually. Number five, we've used that data and rich data as it enters the seam or its equivalent. Number six, um, 
The SIM actually will evaluate incoming alerts against contextual data. That's a lot of fun. And raise or lower their priority. And number seven, um, we can start talking about orchestration. Now, um, orchestration is an interesting one. Whenever people start talking about orchestration and automation in the area of security operations, minds usually go, immediately go to, um, how am I doing response? Um, and they think, you know, changing firewall rules and blocking users and other super flashy shooting cyber bullets in people's faces kind of stuff. Um, I would urge you instead to think about um, what are the other integrations we're going to do to benefit the analyst and speed um, their ability to draw the necessary conclusions. For instance, uh, what if we instead thought about orchestration in terms of build, um, build, bringing in more contextual data? more incriminating evidence for the analyst. Um, oftentimes, that has a lower risk and higher reward. Um, so as um, an engineer in a SOC, we have to work um, at all seven different pieces here, um, constantly bringing down the, the data that we want um, from the sad part, items number one and number two, all the way down to six and seven, if possible. But ultimately, we have to support all seven scenarios, well, at least the bottom six. So um, drilling down a little bit further, I'm going to talk a little bit about Windows security events. Um, now, a lot of the print on these sli this slide here is very small, and it's actually not the point. If we think about just Windows security auditing logs, um, think about the number of different event IDs that we collect. Anybody have a gander at about how many different event IDs we collect uh, in Windows security audit logs? Any guesses? How many? 10,000. Probably less than that. Just, I'm just talking about Windows security event audit logs. Yeah, it's a couple hundred, isn't it? Uh, um, I actually have the number here. Oh, I remember. There it is, 447. That includes a couple of duplicates for ones that didn't ha that have different versions. Um, that's kind of interesting. And if we look at each one of them, that's a 4624, right? Log on event, and uh, you can see there uh, all those different key value pairs um, in that that event. Whereas if we look at a 4688, a process creation event. Uh, a whole bunch of different bag of key value pairs. And finally, God help you if you're ever to collect 5158s or 5157s, yet a different bag of key value pairs. Each of these events don't have necessarily the same schema, or perhaps you could say that you put them all together and it's one big sparsely populated table. If you take all those key value pairs actually and um, put them together and figure out how many unique um, key value pairs you have, you've got over 100. That's over 100 columns in your database. That's a lot. What are we going to do about it? Um, a lot of people say, well, we need a security logging standard. Anybody ever said that before? Everybody heard that before? Right? Hmm. Good idea. Maybe. Uh, well, we have a few already. Um, and every time this comes up, I said, well, we need a security logging standard. I said, well, why don't you pick one of the existing ones we have? Because there's a few. And some are more flexible than the others. Some are newer than others. Um, my usual response is, please, sir, may I have another? But my actual question is, is, do you really want to take the richness of each of these event types and jam them into one common schema? Is that really what you want to do? Because I don't think it is. Everybody, every time I talk to somebody about this and we, we feel the pain over all these different kinds of event types that we can collect or different sources of data, it usually comes to, we need a logging standard. I would actually argue it may be as beneficial to become more adaptive to the various types of rich telemetry we collect. I'll talk more about that in a second. When we think about how to cope with this, there's a lot of different approaches we could take. On the left-hand side is the old school approach. We have a rigid schema. Whenever we bring data in, we have to parse it at the time we ingest it. Every field must have a home. Um, ingest failure option often means we throw away the data, at least if our system isn't built terribly well. So our ingest, by comparison, is relatively expensive, but because we've parsed everything, the analytics and queries on our analysts right, are, by comparison, relatively cheap. On the other end is uh, an approach that is more consistent with those who are familiar with big data. Um, we have no, not necessarily a schema we do. We, ha we do our schema on read as opposed to schema on write, if you're familiar with that term before. Um, we dump all our data into some kind of uh, store, perhaps a distributed one. Um, it's very cheap on ingest, but good luck for our analyst achieving some kind of commonality 
um, when they're reading the data. This is not a tenable situation um, in large SOCs, particularly not with tier one folks who don't want to have to think about what is a schema. I urge you to consider a hybrid approach. It kind of goes like the following. Um, you adapt to the different fields that you're given, but you think about extracting the features of the fields that are most important to you. Um, generally, you're not going to lose your data um, on ingest, right? If you can't parse the data, you still have the, the key value pair um, or key values that, that you were originally presented with, but maybe you didn't extract all the, all the features that you were interested in. So your analyst using this approach um, ha can always depend upon a certain set of fields always being there, especially when they're writing their where clauses in their, their queries. Things are relatively efficient. You still store all the data and you have the richness of what you originally had, but it's not chaos. Ask me a year how this works out, I'll tell you. Um, in addition to that, I would urge you to consider loosely coupling your architecture. What the hell did I just say? So um, consider all the different places you're getting your data from. Um, not just Windows events, though I would urge you to consider those as part of your architecture. And you're going to send them to a lot of different places. You're going to send them um, to a batch analytic platform. You're probably going to do something in near real time. You're going to send them to some data lakes. You're going to send them to some, some, some workflow and ticketing solutions. The list goes on. So what do you, how are you going to adapt to the situation? And tomorrow, when someone else, perhaps with pointy hair, um, comes in and says, I have the new solution that's going to solve all of our problems. How are you going to integrate that shiny new cyber solution um, that's going to save all of the kittens into your architecture? How are you going to loosely couple all those different pieces? I would urge you to consider some kind of message bus in your architecture. The idea is actually very simple. Um, and is, it goes along with products or systems like Kafka or RabbitMQ or what have you. Um, the idea is, is that you're sucking all of your data in from your different sources and you're bringing it into a bus um, that supports things like data replication, node failover, um, short-term cache, um, et cetera, and that all of your different things that need to consume that data read off that bus. Relatively straightforward um, and it'll save you a lot of pain. Um, I'll move on. So for example, um, let's assume we're consuming bro data, all right? Big shout out to the folks who did bro, good times. Um, for those of you not familiar with bro, um, to put a very long story short, think of it like NetFlow, but it includes layers five through seven. So imagine gathering all of the uh, header information from all of your HTTP traffic. Very cool, lots and lots and lots and lots of analytic, forensic, and data science opportunities there. Um, notice that in each of these different connection types, be it DNS, FTP, HTTP, et cetera, um, you have a different set of fields. The field names don't matter in this context. What matters is that they're substantially different. Again, do you really want logging, one logging standard to jam all that data into? I'd suggest not. Um, the the uh, approach that I'm familiar with with Bro is when you're consuming the data, each um, it, different kind of Bro data that you're bringing in um, corresponds to its own Kafka topic. Um, and that you would potentially feed um, each topic into in its own table. Now, that approach works um, in some situations. Consider if you're doing IOC matching, indicator matching like on IPs or domains or what have you. Um, that may be very expensive or very cheap depending on um, how you're able to do that matching. For example, imagine in, your, in your, uh, your columnar or document store, can you query all of the data at once or not? How, how annoying is it going to be for your analysts to query all that data if they need to? Um, I could go on. The point here is, is that there's no one right answer necessarily to how to cope with all of this data. You need to think carefully about what your goals are. Um, further, when we think about gathering all this data in, imagine we've done a good job. I would ask you, does your SOC have an event horizon? Right, if we suck all this data into a giant black hole, I've worked with SOCs that were like this, and it didn't work out very well for them because while their analysts were happy, everyone else was pissed off. Um, rather, I would also uh, um, urge you to consider using a message bus as a way of not only being able to consume your own data, but to give it to other folks. Um, or to consume their data, maybe from their message bus. 
Um, when we think about sharing that data with other organizations, um, uh, trust me, I've been involved in my fair share of, of food fights um, in this area. It's uh, really kind of amusing and interesting to see how a bunch of geeks will get in a room and argue about who gets to own what bits. Um, so let's break that open a little bit and talk about some of our approaches. So the first situation um, is that the SOC wants to um, own and operate their own log analytic program. Um, and that they offer that capability to others. Um, on a good day, that means that you've saved a whole bunch of folks a lot of time and money. Um, on the other, on the bad day, that means they're in a giant food fight. Um, second, um, let's say we've opened that to others. We've, um, by doing that, we've empowered other teams to find badness. Sounds really cool, right? It's not just your analysts analyzing anymore, you've taken in the other IT professionals in your enterprise and you said, you, you can be an analyst and you can be an analyst and you can be an analyst and it all sounds great, right? Um, on a bad day, um, what, what's going to happen is they're going to compromise your investigations and then sometimes actually support collusion between different system administrators. Not good. Um, imagine further if you um, empower those folks to create their own analytics. Sounds great, right? Um, further force multiplier. I mean, in fact, you would enable other teams to write analytics that you yourself would never either have time for or have the understanding of creating. All that, think about all that, that knowledge of what happens in those lines of business. Um, on a bad day, that means your system craters because they wrote awful queries and generated a million false alarms. And then finally, um, imagine that you're providing um, views into your data um, to others. Uh, that sounds great too, right? Um, the, you've, you've, given, you've used your RBAC solution or what have you, your identity federation, other buzzwords and other bingos um, to give them that access. Um, on a bad day, that means they're squashing each other's toes um, and you've potentially duplicated data in many places. Not good. Um, so we want to aim for good day. We don't want to have a bad day with the situation. And I have a couple thoughts um, on how to mitigate these risks. First of all, when we think about having that shared analytic platform, we can talk about having a shared capital expense or talk about enterprise licensing, particularly in large enterprises. Um, but specifically, we want to be clear on the governance and the rules who gets to own and, and is the custodian of that data in the first place. Um, secondarily, when we think about opening that up to others, um, let's make sure that we've got um, a good identity and authorization story for them. Um, how are we doing that? For instance, uh, the SOC may hoard their data and they may have a very closed environment. Um, how do they play with others? Are they going to participate in the, in the uh, same domain? Um, are they going to participate in the same AD forest that everybody else is in? Is that a good idea? It's a very good question. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Nevertheless, we want to make sure that others' access to that data is arbitrated through something, something resembling multi-factor authentication, if nothing else. Uh, let's see here. Um, and when others are writing those queries, right, as a SOC, you're probably going to want to put together some kind of training program for them so they're not doing the, uh, the equivalent to full table scans, which in a relational database is bad news, right? And you want to monitor uh, the query performance um, that they're using. Every day, um, I get an email that tells me the 10 worst queries someone wrote yesterday on the analytic platform that I'm running. And that helps me understand, first of all, how badass some of the analysts are because they're writing ridiculously ornate queries. And it also helps me understand when systems are running close to cratering the system. I urge you to do something similar. Um, and then finally, um, we need to think about how we tailor those views. Um, so again, I mentioned access control, um, and we also want to consider that data bus to move the data around because again, you're probably not going to be the only data lake in your enterprise any longer. Um, now around this time, someone usually asks me, what about the cloud? Let's talk about the cloud for one slide, shall we? So people ask, should I put my SIEM or my log analytics or what have you in the cloud? I say, well, that's a really great question. There's a lot of considerations here. First of all, you need to look at the specific solutions and, and look at, um, are they going to really meet your need? For example, I'm aware, I'm not going to name vendor names. When you go and buy their uh, cloud analytic platform, are you really getting software or platform as a service or are you getting dressed up IaaS? infrastructure as a service where they've used automation to stand up their product on nothing more than perhaps a Linux VM and they walk away. 
or is it somewhere in between? Is that solution elastic, meaning will it spin up and spin down nodes based on capacity and utilization? Do you want that feature? Um, is, it a, is it an actual SIEM platform or something like it, or is it purely log analytics? Number two, where are your assets? If your company is based entirely in the cloud, does it make sense for you, for example, to have something on-prem just for your logs? Probably not. Number three, what security measures does that provider provide you? How do they um, federate the identity and access to your Active Director or whatever LDAP or Kerberos or what have you system you're using in your enterprise or just in your SOC? Um, what's the forensic quality and integrity of that data? What are they doing to preserve that? Um, to say nothing of compliance. Um, number four, how can that tool integrate with your stuff, right? You can send all of your locked data to the cloud. Um, do they provide you the same integration and pivoting story I talked about earlier in this brief? And finally, can you get your data out? Do they charge you per gigabyte for the data that you download? Because some of them do. Probably worth asking, especially when there's an investigation six months from now. Uh-oh. Um... Thinking about the, the health of all of this capability, um, there's a lot of different dimensions that you can look at, and, and, and some have only really become a, uh, evident to me in the last several years. There's the obvious one. We can instrument our platform to make sure it's up and whether it's pegged or not, but let's go a lot further than that. Let's talk about data quality. We can write a set of standing queries um, or some other me method of evaluating, is my data parsed more or less than it was yesterday? Are all of my data feeds alive? Um, has the volume of each data feed changed over time? One of the best ways I have found to find um, broken sensors and broken data feeds um, is actually to measure um, each data feed, each sensor's normal volume over time, and then look if it's had a recent drop. Right, no static list of sensors or data feeds, nothing like that. You're simply saying, are we getting less data today than we were yesterday for a given feed? And I guarantee you, this process will help you find stuff that broke, and things do break, trust me. Um, number three, we want to measure our coverage. I mentioned this way earlier in the brief. Now, um, I would urge you to consider two dimensions for coverage at the very least. First of all is the absolute number of assets in a given part of your enterprise that you're monitoring, but also the percentage. You've got to have both, because if telling just one of those numbers doesn't tell the full story. For example, tomorrow you discover you have 5,000 more assets in the given domain. Doesn't your coverage percentage drops, but your knowledge of what you need to monitor goes up. You need to tell that story. Number two, you need to consider the asset type that you're covered, covering. Chances are covering Windows devices in your enterprise are relatively straightforward, or for instance, your IDSs. How's your coverage going on in everything else? That's in getting increasing scrutiny, particularly around IoT, if you're paying any attention. And then finally, where in the computing stack are you instrumenting? Is it just the operating system? I hope not. Though bro logs plus Windows events can get you really, 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 really far, they're not the whole story. Are you instrumenting the maintenance backplane? Are you getting logs for, I don't know, your ILOs or your IDRACs? Are you getting it from your applications and services, particularly those from the cloud? Number four, um, looking at the uh, quality and health of your analytics and your detections. For example, a good SOC every day will have a dashboard that says basically how many alerts their analyst got yesterday and how many were considered false positives or true positives or something along those lines. I would urge you, if you're not doing something like that, to have a daily stand-up where such things were discussed. What new detections were created yesterday? Which ones were turned off? Did we see anomalies um, in the system, et cetera? Particularly, um, driving analytics and driving metrics around um, the analytics that your, your analysts found useful versus the ones that they didn't will help you improve the quality um, of your analytics and your investigations. Um, or perhaps around the analysts themselves, which analysts are producing more trash versus more gold, not to be too pejorative. And number five, um, uh, measuring your system. We heard, uh, I think it was yesterday, um, and it's not the first time I've heard a similar story, very, very good story about using a, a capability to put in your enterprise to trigger your detections, right? Perhaps measured along the attack framework. 
Really, really good thing to look at. I promise you it will be a very humbling experience. Every time I see someone do this, they, did, they, they measure their detections, they measure their coverage um, along such things. They use something to actually trigger, like dropping ICAR files, as simple as that, on your hosts. It will be humbling to you. You will find things that are broken that you thought were working. In addition to that, and finally, um, pen test your shit. It's fun. So to conclude, um, I want to offer you seven points. The first is, is um, obviously, engineer to your user's requirements, right? I, mean, I showed you a slide that had just tier one type requirements. Consider that you're going to need to give similar attention to everyone else in your SOC. Um, number two, be resourceful. One of the best analysts I ever met uh, was so good, not because of his analytic tradecraft, um, but because he was so resourceful at finding and using other people's data, data that the SOC didn't have, but other business units had. And that, that is why he was so successful, because during um, response times or even um, looking, finding bad guys doing hunting, he was good at leveraging others' data. Number three, you need to have a very strong integration story because you're never going to be able to bring it all in one place and you're never going to have just one product to do it. Number four, you need to be able to tolerate the richness in all the sources of your data. I recognize we all want to have one common data standard, but suffice it to say, we're probably never going to get there. So you need to be able to support that richness um, for your analysts because otherwise they're going to need to go back and get that original data. And that's very expensive at times. Number five. Um, you need to be able to share your data with others, but doing so with great care. Um, number six, um, consider the mix of um, cloud versus on-prem moving forward, or having at the very least a deliberate story and why you're choosing one approach or the other. Um, trust me, it'll help you, especially when someone pointing here comes in and says, why aren't we in the cloud? It's very important, the cloud. I don't know, it's just a fad, I think. Just kidding. Um, and number seven, always be measuring um, the health of your analytic platform or your SOC generally. Um, I'll actually be giving a talk uh, this coming summer um, in July at the SANS SOC Summit um, in New Orleans um, on that very topic. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you for joining me um, way the hell too early on a Sunday morning. Um, I'll take questions. And I actually have uh, four books to give away for the best, best questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you have any examples of either single suites or compositions on any different tools that target this? Like is there a specific tool that you target this? Because you you've talked a lot about you know, the log analysis, the log ingest. Yes. But you also have the ticket orchestration workflow and everything else around that too. So I'm not going to endorse any commercial vendors here on stage. I will tell you that there's two um, incubation Apache products, product systems. Uh, they're a mishmash of existing Hadoop stuff. Um, that you put together that um, suggest that they're headed in that direction, but some pieces are missing. Um, and one of the things that, that troubles me is if you go and do that solution, you may be to the exclusion of others, um, but um, I've seen a lot of folks, uh, and I actually would wish that there would be a better story here, on folks that say, listen, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the Hadoop ecosystem, for example, that can do a lot of this. Somebody should probably be putting that together, and I think some folks are starting to actually do that. Um, but I'm not going to name, name names here on stage. Uh, two over here, the gentleman in front first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question was, is do I see a, an evolution with vendors getting better at their logging? Um, yes, uh, but that's a holly, highly qualified yes. The issue is, is, as I see it, I see a lot of folks pro are producing prodigious information, and um, you know some vendors um, are doing a really good job of, of um, improving that story over time. Um, again, no bias. Um, but, you know, look at, for instance, the story with, um, you know, Windows OS logging today versus 15 years ago, right? Different schema came out um, with Vista, et cetera. I think I've got that right. Um, and you see that story improve all day. If you actually go in, there's a bunch of PowerShell commands um, that you can run to look at all the different um, security logging providers in, in Windows. And it's, it's outrageous if you go look at the full list. So um, that's just one example. There, there are many others. The question is, is, is trying to get them to 
um, give you that data in a way that is machine readable. Let me give you another example, syslog, right? We all have to collect syslog data, right? How, uh, how good are we at doing entity extraction from syslog data? It sucks, right? Right? You could go and write in a log stash filter for it, um, and there's some out there, but then you have to go that, do that again and again and again and again for every different flip, flip and syslog um, feed that you're getting. Yet, I'm familiar with some firewall vendors that will give you Ceph formatted data in syslog, which is, I'll oh, thank God, right? So yeah, I do see some convergence there, but ultimately it comes down to what's the economic incentive for those organizations, those other vendors to do that? Yes, right. So there's a comment um, from my my esteemed fellow in the way back. Um, there's sometimes a reserve, reverse incentive so that they can claim their own logging standard as their own intellectual property. Good point. Uh, next question, sir. So the question was, um, what comments do I have on um, data ingest, data normalization to support orchestration? That's a really good comment, and that's actually one of the reasons why we can't just have a chaos of data schema, right? Um, and I would think very carefully about having very good data quality um, and circuit breakers in my pipeline to ensure that incorrectly parsed data doesn't in, um, result in um, orchestration stuff, doing things you didn't expect. Um, this is actually one of my biggest worries. There's one sim vendor that I'm not going to name on stage about 10 years ago. Um, we would send them in incorrectly formatted data um, or data that contained characters that the product didn't expect and the product would crash. Um, and we're like, that's not good. If the adversary knew this, um, you know, they'd be able to knock it over, just like you would see um, people at uh, CTF at DEF CON in years past knock over Wireshark, right, with a, some kind of buffer overflow or format issue or something like that. Um, so I don't have a really good straight answer for you other than to acknowledge it's a problem. I would urge you to, to build in um, strong data quality analysis um, and metrics into your pipeline will alert you, hey, this is a thing that's happening, and maybe turn off the orchestration thing when those numbers go f far out of tolerance. That's the one thought that comes to my mind. Thank you. Uh, come on up. Uh, gentleman in the back. Yes. Um, I can, so uh, I'm not here to sell a specific vendor, though I can tell you, um, thank you. Um, I've had a lot of luck with Kafka, frankly. Um, there's a lot of good resources on, there on the internet. There's a lot of good white papers. Um, I'm not going to endorse the specific vendor that wrote a lot of them, um, but there's a lot of good white papers on how to make Kafka really good at high speed um, with high resiliency, ensuring um, exactly one data receipt. Um, and you can talk about the trade space there in terms of timeliness measured in milliseconds and other such things. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Who went first? Right here in the front. <laughs> Send me a note on LinkedIn um, or find, uh, talk to me right afterwards. Gentleman behind him. So the comment slash question was, is what's my thoughts on agent versus agent list in terms of data collection? So my first comment is, I've heard many sim vendors in the past generally say, well, we're agent less. I say that's bullshit. And the reason why I say that's bullshit is that because there must be a piece of software somewhere in your architecture that does the equivalent of ETL, right? So you've got to have a thing that parses and brings that data into your architecture. Um, that said, I think your question was along the lines of, am I going to put a specific agent on all the boxes in my enterprise, like all my Windows boxes? Do I have that right? Like EDR solutions? Yeah. So you can get, you can make, uh, do a lot of really fun things with that. That. And I um, am not really prepared today to talk about um, ETL um, in Windows, or excuse me, uh, ETW collection. Um, 
I would like to, though, at some point. Um, that is a new and, or relatively growing um, area of data ingest, and you see that usually agent-based. Um, further, we want to got it um, have a really good ability to um, gather data in a response scenario. And usually, but not always, um, agents are going to be what you're going to do to get that. On the other hand, um, what is that? Uh, does that impact uh, your ability to um, get owned? Right by the adversary, we often see good, really good pen testers and really good adversaries utilize the same accounts or agents you put on all your boxes to own them. And because you've uh, you've whitelisted that on your detections, right? You've whitelisted your vulnerability scanning um, on your detections. You won't notice it. So um, it's a double-edged sword. Um, that said, I have seen people um, do amazing things with PowerShell remoting um, to achieve a lot of the same effect. Um, that you would get with an agent. So if you haven't looked up Windows event collection and forwarding, um, that plus um, a re remote PowerShell capability could get you pretty far um, if you don't want to put agents on your systems. But again, what are the credentials you're using to enable that, right? So uh, again, do care. Great question. Come on up and get a book. I have two left. More qu I think I've got uh, three more minutes for questions. Sir in the Syracuse shirt. Yes. Okay, hit me. Okay, so I think the question was is, is there a common data standard for moving data across a data bus? Did I have that right? Oh, yeah, specifically for the sort of data I was talking about. Um, there could be, if you wanted there to be, right, you could say, you could stipulate, I'm going to have a certain serialization around JSON or XML, and I'm going to adhere that data to a certain schema. And you could pick the schemas from that list or perhaps another. Um, it's, it's a choice you have to make. You could. Um, it depends. You need to pick a standard. Right, and I've I've seen folks pick standards. I've seen um, people move Ceph data across Kafka, right, and pick your serialization and how you want to encode that data. Um, that's one way to do it. I mean, on the other hand, for instance, Bro, as far as I'm familiar with it, will send that data to you in JSON already. There's no ETL that's needed. You plug it right into Kafka, and it's really cool um, that way. And but but again, then you're working with the schema that Bro gave you, for better and for worse. Interesting question. Um, I think I have time for one more. In the front, sir. So a lot of times when I'm like talking to people that work at um, getting data for logging against screen events, I always try to push this other idea where I like to tie every logging event with like a time time value thing, so it like ticks or something. And I like like to really encourage that and always like send ticks for like like to graph or something like that, and then also send log events. I'm like curious if you have any sort of thoughts on that, like that. Okay, so I think the comment was around, hey, um, consider collecting um, information, time, time series information around the data you're collecting, um, in addition to destroying the, the logs fully. Do I have that right? Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm going to take a tangent off that, and you tell me if I, if I, if I took a left turn too hard or not. Um, when I bring data into a pipeline, I timestamp the shit out of it. Like, I timestamp it at my ETL layer, I timestamp it at the time it hits the message bus, I timestamp it at the, day, the time it came off the message bus, the time um, it came into my, my uh, document or columnar store, I'll timestamp it at the time it hit my analytic platform, I timestamp it in every place. And the reason why I'm doing that is to look at um, delays or, or lack of, um, uh, you know, performance issues anywhere in that, that timeline because we're you're going to have time issues. Oh, God, you're going to have time issues generally. I've spent so much time fighting time issues because um, shit, you know, people have got stuff like, why is your device in West Greenland time? Is that router really in West Greenland? I think you just didn't set the time right. Um, so that's always a big problem. Sorry, I probably took a way big left turn from what you were saying. So you're saying, hey, should I, should I calculate statistics in my data as it's coming into my, my analytic pipeline? I completely agree with you, and I want to talk to you about more of that offline. 
Um, so again, I want to use that that last uh, question to make a comment, and then we'll wrap up here. Is is these are all choices you have to make, and I would argue no one answer is the right answer necessarily. You've got all these options, so please give them some care. Thank you.